Hello everybody, Chris Martinson here, and today we're gonna to be talking about finance and economics as part of Finance U. Remember, anything that you see in this video and all resources available at our websites or affiliated websites are not intended as or construed as financial advice. This is for educational purposes. Remember, if you have a financial decision, please consult a financial professional. We are not attorneys, we're not CPAs, we are not financial managers. As well, we do our best to be accurate, and everything we represent is as accurate as we know it to be. Now, let's turn to our program. So that was just sort of a unilateral thing. Biden administration decided let's weaponize the dollar, and they did that. And I, I think what we're talking about here is really just the consequence of that. And, and maybe these things were already in motion before, but man, this put a rocket burner on them. All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this Finance University big, big episode today. We're going to be discussing gold and silver and what's happening there. We're going to be discussing what's happening in Japan, things you need to know about. Hey, uh, are the market's going to crack from here. Who knows? But really important development. Paul Kiker of Kiker Wealth Management is going to also talk with us about something called the unit. What are the bricks up to? There are really big things happening now. Paul, so good to see you again. Good to see you as well on this beautiful day, Chris. Yeah. So um, just, you know, I, I am I, I will tell you the things we are going to be talking about today, Paul, have gotten me working. I wouldn't say frantically, but I'm putting a lot more effort in on the old farm these days. Yes. <laughs> getting, I'm getting things ready and tightened up, you know, uh, in sailing vernacular, the bat, the hats, hatches would be battened down. Um, that's what I'm doing here. I agree. I'm doing the same thing and I'm looking forward to it uh, every afternoon and every weekend because I'm spending so much time reading, trying to keep up with what's going on and monitoring things because, you know, it may be it may be calm right now, but it sure feels like calm before the storm with all the creaking and popping taking place around the edges. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now oh, this is um, this was the, the chart that really caught my attention this past week. I, I've talked about it with my subscribers back at Peak Prosperity. I, I may have done this out in public a bit, too, but I wanted to get your views on this, your eyes as a finance professional. So this is above the zero mark, which is here. Mm -hmm. China would be buying more treasuries and agencies, agencies being mortgage-backed securities. Um, you know, why a foreign government is allowed to buy our mortgages, I'm not clear on that. But anyway, leaving that aside, anything above zero, they're buying more than they're selling. Anything below zero, they're selling more than they're buying. And it caught some attention because here in January, or this first quarter, I guess these are quarterlies, yeah, this first quarter of 2024, they sold $53 billion net. Um, it's a big deal. It's, well, it's the most ever in this whole series that they've sold. Yes. And that is a big deal from a, from a liquidity standpoint. Um, you know, obviously they've got some issues taking place with their economy. There's all kinds of speculation about how they're going to deal with it. But this seems more than just trying to support their local economy. It seems to me that, that based on what we're hearing, what we're reading, what they're stating and what their actions are is they're they're reducing their dependence upon the US dollar at this point. And it's wise, especially if they anticipate that the US dollar is going to stop increasing relative to other currencies and working its way down as well. So mm -hmm. there is a strategic change on their part. Yeah, that's well, also in January they did buy hundred and twenty three thousand kilo bars of gold from just from Switzerland. Uh, which is a prime source for them. But yeah, that's 123 tons of gold in a single single month. And I've also been reading reports, Paul, that India is a mega purchaser of silver here at this point in time. What that means, I don't know, but maybe we can connect it into this this thing called the unit you're going to tell us about. But um, it really feels, this is momentous. I just, what I'd love to alert people to here is that I don't know what's going on, but I can sure track when things are different. And we saw big breakdowns in gold, right? Which was the relationship between negative real interest rates and gold, which is normally highly correlated with one being inverted to the other. But I mean, just tracks beautifully. 2022, that broke down. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, and that's a big deal. I've been tracking that one for forever. And it's been rock solid for me. And, and it broke down. Why did it break down? Well, looks like somebody's buying it anyway. <laughs> interest rates be darned so mm -hmm. uh that that's clear so and we've been hearing rumblings that central banks are now purchasers the only people i can find the only entities i can find paul 
in the news and actually in my own experience set in life who are sellers of gold and silver is U.S. retail and Germany. They're, they're, they're also not buying like they used to. And I don't... <laughs> in Germany, they, they are inveterate bar stashers and box people, right? And they're also... So I can't explain that except to say, wow, somebody's running a PSYOP on them and I don't saying, get it. I don't know where that's come from. You know, I get it from the U.S. retail investors to an extent. I do just because of all the, the propaganda that's that's pushed upon them. You know, how main Wall Street typically your big firms are like, oh, don't touch gold. I mean, even some individuals that I respect from a personal finance standpoint out there, the one thing I disagree with is them talking about, oh, you shouldn't own gold. But it seems like Germany is doing exactly opposite of what should be done uh, from a sovereign end. It's like, okay, this is the way we should go. Let's just turn around and do exactly opposite of that. But back to retail, Chris, you know, one thing that amazes me right now, and I'll go back and show the chart here in just a minute, but, you know, one of the things we've talked about over the past couple of months is just the major breakout that occurred with gold, breaking out of that upper resistance. So all of a sudden it looks like we have a buyer who is no longer price sensitive. In other words, hey, I'm purchasing it. And this happened during an environment where everything is stacked against gold, where gold prices should be flat to down from a historical textbook standpoint. Silver's breaking out here recently. It's up even more percentage-wise than gold has been in the past six months. So something has taken place behind the scenes. But I'm getting more calls on a retail and local level and texts from individuals that you know, I haven't talked to for some time that I'd recommended buy silver, you know, back when it was nine, ten dollars an ounce. Not to cherry pick something, that's exactly the conversation behind. I, you know, you're not supposed to put out great whatever. Anyway, so trying to follow regulations, guys. <laughs> Stop my thought process for a second. So anyway, the question is, is hey, are you selling? You know, I'm thinking about selling. I'm like, okay, not a recommendation to the listeners out there, but no, if you're selling, I would be interested in buying because what I'm seeing take place tells me that everything is in place for a bull market in precious metals to start, but retail are sellers across the board or they're frozen from the standpoint of, hey, you know, it's gone up a lot. Maybe I shouldn't purchase it. But when you listen to what's taking place out of India and out of China, they're not hesitating. They're not blinking. Something has changed, especially when you get, you know, China's selling treasuries and agency debt, further de-dollarizing. And then you've got all this news that comes out about the unit, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, you know, it's a different backdrop. And I'm, it doesn't surprise me, right? But retail tends to chase things when they're doing well. Fear of missing out is what drives them more than anything. And unfortunately, in our psychology, even more so today with social media, we seem to be insecure in our decisions. We want someone else to tell us, not we as in most of us that are listening, but we as a collective society want somebody to tell us what to do because we're scared of making a mistake. And that herd mentality is where people feel comfortable when they don't know what to do. So if the media is telling them to sell it, then they feel comfortable selling it. And that's really to genuinely exactly opposite of what we should be doing. Yeah, I'm going to look for this really quickly. Um, oh shoot, I didn't save it up. So, um, well, I just, I, I just, the news flashed across my wire this morning that, um, that I forget who it was, but it was one of the big desks, so either J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, said, by 2034, we'd kind of guess that, you know, public debt, there's two types of federal debt, public and then intragovernmental, so it's total. They said public debt was going to be at, uh, by 2034, was going to sneak all the way up to 90, uh, I think it was 98% or something like that of GDP. And they, they, they revised it. They revised it to 130% today. 130. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, now I remember because it, it was ninety-seven percent, and it was up, and it went to hundred thirty. I remember because that's thirty-three, and that was exactly a third. They, they were off by, they were off by a third. Um, it's not often that you can be like these are pretty easy calculations to run at that level. You know, it's like, hey, what what spending is set in stone? Where's it going to go? What where do we think the GDP is going to go? And and you you just kept you just divide one by the other. They were off by thirty-three percent, which is kind of a big miss. So either they had the interns run in the prior you know, formulas or, or something's really changed of late. And so it's, I think we are clearly, Paul, we're in out of control fiscal expenditures. And I don't see a single person in DC 
outside of just a couple. You got your Thomas Masseys and, you know, there's a few. Mm -hmm. But there's no appetite whatsoever to even talk about it as if it's an issue or a problem. Um, everything I see them doing is just spending more. So I'm reasonably confident that this inflation we're experiencing is mm -hmm. going to get worse, not better from here. No, I am too. All of the information points to inflation accelerating at some point in the future. We may have a little bit of a dip here in the short run where technically you see a little bit of disinflation in the short run, but I still believe this is like the birth pains. Okay, we've had that first birth pain like occurred in the 1970s. We get a period of reprieve, and then you're going to have the next birth pain, and then it's going to be quicker and quicker and quicker until we either change our behavior and the leadership in our nation, which it seems to me that they can justify anything. You know, hey, we're, we're going to run the country over the edge of a cliff so that we can stay in power because the other party's terrible. Or the new party's coming in, hey, you know, we don't have anybody fiscally responsible. And I think a lot of it's just our hindsight bias. You know, we've gotten away with this in the past, and we've not had something terrible occur. And so they can't imagine that something terrible is going to occur because, hey, in the past 20 years, we've been fiscally irresponsible. We've, we've kept interest rates artificially low. Yeah, this is just a bump in the road. This will go away. Don't think that's the case now. There's too many things that are taking place on a global scale. You know, and especially with the unit, as we'll talk about that in a little bit, you know, it's, in, it's accelerating, it seems, in reaction to our weaponization of the dollar and sanctions, you know, because we're in position as a country to, to do that. It's not the right thing to do, but, but we're doing that and it makes the pain of changing to another system easier because the pain of staying the same is, is basically certain at this point. Well, let's talk about what that, cause you know, this has huge implications. I feel, you know, I feel for you and your business where you're trying to, you know, help manage money for people and uh, for everybody who has wealth and, and it shouldn't be this hard. Like, like let, let me put a judgment out there. Yeah. It shouldn't be like a full-time job just to make sure it doesn't just get taken from you or gets evaporated or some small group of people in some wood paneled room called the FOMC makes a decision that suddenly makes you wrong for having thought it through, analyzed it and figured stuff out carefully. Right. So it's kind of that overall manipulation and rigging of the markets really bothers me because it's already hard enough, you know, <laughs> that makes it like a whole extra layer of difficulty on the situation. Well, it is. And so this is around my 26 year now of being in this industry and, and, and things are moving faster than they've ever moved before. You've got mm -hmm. deglobalization taking place. You've got a lot of things that, that you would never anticipate have happened, have happened. And then on top of that, one of the things that's so frustrating to me, and this is why as, as an advisor and, and individual in this industry, right now is a time where you can really tell the difference between those who love it. And don't get me wrong, there are people in our industry who love working with people and they want to make a difference, right? They got in this industry, mm -hmm. they want to make a difference, but they don't enjoy doing the research, right? They farm that out to someone else. Now, I'm not a research analyst, but I love reading the research and, and double checking, trust but verify. But on top of that, I cannot explain the level of government regulations that keep coming down on us that are independent in this industry that requires to do paperwork after paperwork after paperwork after paperwork. And we had to do it as a team this morning, just covering, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. We've got more paperwork that we've got to do. And luckily, I've got a team that I can pass that off to, but I don't know if it's a distraction. I don't know if I don't necessarily believe that it's intentional. It's just trying to shift responsibility off on somebody else. But um, it does make it tough. But I but I love it. So when you like something, you, you fight tooth and nail to get through and you hope that it gets better in time, but plan for the worst case scenario. So one of the things I want to share with you as a backdrop here is let's just go back and, and look at that. Um, look at the breakout that occurred in gold. So I, I want to reference that here because I do believe this is, this is very important. So what I'm showing on the screen here, if you can see it, Chris, is this is gold. End of day. It's not up yet. It's, okay. it's coming up soon. There it's we go. Working its way up slowly. So this is gold. End of day continuous contract. It just makes it easy to track gold. So 
you know, I've got a lot of lines in here. This is something that I put in to, to look at. But what I want to point out is this resistance that we had here going back to 2020. And this is a weekly chart. So this is, you know, going back to 2015. So we had a breakout that occurred back in 2019. And I've got highlighted here what's called a bull flag. And then we consolidated for a period of time. And when everything was stacked against the price of gold, not only do we have a breakout, but we have true escape velocity, you know, a sheer vertical move here in the short run. So, you know, that tells us, you know, I kind of scratch my head when that happens. I'm excited because gold is a position that, you know, we have in the portfolios. We, we believe that people should own it from a long-term insurance standpoint as a part of their portfolio, hope, you know, hoping that it doesn't go up, but, but as a safety net to make sure that you have it kind of like fire insurance on your, on your home or property and casualty insurance. But this is a pretty big deal. And even, even more so that we had a little bit of a correction or continuing to break out, trying to break out to new highs. Now it, it could correct over the next couple of weeks, but from a long-term standpoint, this is a pretty big deal. So taking that into consideration, um, I want to reference, um, well, that, I mean, there's a, there's a change, right? So we're just trying to get our sense of, of a change. There's a changing of the guard here. And it's going to become a multipolar world, whether the United States wants it or not. Yes. And unfortunately, you know, the United States has taken the position of wanting to weaponize the dollar to use it for geopolitical and strategic purposes. And, and, and that violates a lot of contracts out there in essence. Right. right. Um, and, and so that was just sort of a unilateral thing. Biden administration decided let's weaponize the dollar. And they did that. And I, I think, what we're talking about here is really just a consequence of that. It, and maybe these things were already in motion before, but man, this put a rocket burner on them. Um, and, and so I, their changes are, gonna, are coming fast and people need to know about them. And most people aren't going to know about them, Paul. They're going to wake up one day and three months later, they'll sort of figure out what happened. And But hopefully we're talking here now to people who, who want to see this coming in advance because this is really a big deal. It is. This, like nothing like this has happened in my lifetime. And I'm not a spring chicken, you know? No. And I think one of the problems that makes it hard for individuals, Chris, and even professionals in the industry, is I remember going back to after the great crisis in 2008, uh, you know, Medvedev comes out at the president of Russia at the time and announces a special drawing right currency that would be gold back. Well, there were, were many that were calling for the end of the dollar at that time. And quite frankly, when I looked out and I said, okay, this is the path we're heading on, yeah, you know, that, that's something that is probably going to happen in our lifetime. The problem is we can make quick decisions as individuals in our lives, but these things take quite some time to play out. So the news media comes out and they're like, oh, you know, these doom and gloomers, they're saying the dollar is going to be replaced on the global reserve currency. They trot out all of these experts that say that'll never happen. Because it takes time for that to take place and, you know, slowly and then all at once is the way that it's going to occur. And what concerns me is right now it's starting to accelerate. Now, I don't know how quick this unfolds, you know, but, but we're seeing continued steps and quicker steps in that direction with more coordinated intervention with lack of buying of U.S. Treasuries and, and, and government debt and selling coming out of China. And then you, you have some of these announcements that take take place, and it makes sense. I want to share this this one article out of. Um, uh, let me make sure I've got the right one because I had one that I highlighted to make it a little bit easier. So bear with me. Um, and window. Well, there it is. Okay. So this is out of. Um, this is an article out of the India Foundation. Now, this article was September the 2nd of 2023. So you're going back to about a year ago. And what's important about this is I'm just going to read it as we're highlighted here. It says, for years, the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, have been experimenting with the use of their national currencies in trade and agreements within the group and also with other emerging countries. A process of progressive de-dollarization, so that's the key there, right, of their trade mm -hmm. economies is underway. So they're saying here, this is underway, involving now other regions of the world like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO, countries and the nations of uh, Mer 
kosher. I'm going to you know, butcher that for you guys. So in this context, many Western analysts continue to assert that the BRICS coordination has no future. Wouldn't you agree with that, Chris? When you listen to the media and what, what Western analysts say, they can't get along. You know, this article says it's doomed to fail. But these, quote, experts should remember that BRICS coordination came into being in connection with and as a response to the great global crisis of 2008, which was caused by the collapse of the U.S. and international banking and financial systems. The effects were devastating with respect to the production of goods and to world trade. The hardest hit was indeed the poor and developing countries, that is, those who did not bear the responsibility for the economic and monetary mismanagement and financial speculation, but who paid a heavy price for the consequences. You know, Chris, I, I knew that, you know, kind of stopping the reading of the article there, but, you know, I never realized just how impactful that was. You've got an article that's written out of a foundation in India, you know, 15 years later, and this is a scar that they're still talking about that occurred in the 2008 crisis. Mm -hmm. Then it goes on to say, all financial data confirm that the global financial situation is worse today than that of 2008. For example, and this is you know back six months ago, world public debt moved from 41 to 92 trillion. Global debt is at 305 trillion, 45 trillion higher than its pre-pandemic level. The mostly unregulated and often speculative non-bank financial institutions overcame the banking system globally, uh, etc. Therefore, despite all legitimate differing national orientations and sometimes diverging or competing interests of the BRIC countries, the necessity to have a safety net and of crafting an alternative to the likely crisis of the dollar and related systems remains, remains stronger than before. So, you know, the article goes on to, to talk about, um, you know, trade and the impacts, you know, what took place. It's quite a fascinating article, but that lays the foundation for what the rest of the world has been working towards. And, you know, and we've talked before, Chris, about if you and I both banked at the same place and the, and the president of the bank gets frustrated at you because he doesn't like your political stance or something like that and debanks you, the first thing I'm going to do is go find an alternative. And uh, you may want to comment on that, but next leads to the unit. Um, well, but, before before we go there, though, I mean, they mentioned $305 trillion in that. I've seen numbers as high as $320 trillion. That That's just global debt. But but can we, can we just put this in context? Because this is what they call TCMDO on the FRED series. This is uh, uh, Federal Reserve data. And uh, I really like the FRED. I go there all the time for stuff. I do. I do too, this, as of the fourth quarter of 2023, and by the way, we're, we're way past this. I'm waiting for them to update it. When they update to the fourth quarter, um, and let alone the first quarter, first quarter. So this is 98 trillion, 372 billion. So, so this is just U.S. total credit market debt outstanding, not liabilities, Paul. We don't have any like underfunded Social Security or Medicare in here or any of that. This is just debt that they can add up within our system here in the United States. And I assume this is stuff in the pub, in the in the what we call the the lit pools, not the dark pools. There yes. well, well could be other agreements they don't know about. But but in the system, you push some buttons and you add it up, ninety eight trillion. So let's round up. We'll call it a hundred trillion because it's actually over a hundred trillion at this point. That means the United States has about 30% of the world's leverage, and we have 5% of the world's population. We have the most leverage here. So back to that thing where you said, you know, these countries are like, hey, this seems a little unfair. You guys did some really stupid things, and we ended up paying the heavier price. Mm -hmm. That doesn't feel fair. That $100 trillion of debt, Paul, that's going to wipe out. That is absolute. There's no way to pay it back. It just, it's, just, it's a broken system. So, I mean, even Jerome Powell has said that, right, in front of, you know, Senate testimonies and other things. He's like, well, you know, it is grow Our debt is growing faster than our economy. That is unsustainable. Like, when did you figure that out? Um, <laughs> I figured it out on or around August 15th, 1971 um, is where we should have sort of figured out whether this thing had a problem. But we have a math problem. That's what I'm pointing to. Paul, that is a giant math problem right there. And you said 98 yeah, but it's over 100 now. Um, so that, ugh, I don't know what to tell you about that. Bizarre. Okay. Over 100, and they're, they're saying world debt was $92 trillion going back there. So that even that yeah. was grossly underestimated if you're counting the rest of the world in comparison to the U.S. 
Right. So the story up to this point in time, for those of you keeping track at home, the United States has been this giant ocean-going ship, and all these emerging developing countries have lashed their tender ships to it. And somewhere in the last 10, 15 years, they've said, kind of looks like the Titanic. Maybe we should cut the tender lines, you know? Yeah. And, and that's okay. So so that's sort of my context for, for the brick thing is just good old fashioned self interest. We we don't we don't want to be attached to that thing. It's gonna sink. It looks terrible, you know? Why why should we suffer because you guys did such a terrible job living within your means? Yeah. Well, not only that, you've got you've got individuals in the administration that are standing on the top uh, top deck of that ship, shooting at the sh- ships that are linked to it. You're going through <laughs> yeah. sanctions, right? Yeah. So, but one thing that uh, the American people can understand, I, I I read a poll and it just came to mind, and I wish I knew exactly what it was. But on both sides, Democrats and Republicans both see the Federal Reserve and their behavior is one of the main problems for the U.S. citizens, right? But but the rest of the world can actually do something about it. We can through voting power, but the reality is, is we've got two candidates on both sides of the uh, both sides of the aisle that are not fiscally responsible that really could care less about our debt. I don't know anybody that's run. You know, there are a few, but there's no mass options for us to be able to vote for that's going to make a serious impact for the Federal Reserve. But yet, you've got the rest of the world who's consistent consistently taking steps to pre- protect them and their own citizens to bring about an alternative, trustworthy, you know, and according to the unit, a decentralized, not controlled by any one individual, decentralized um, uh, currency that can be utilized for trade. Uh, so that gives them the ability to overcome their differences and have a trust but verify open source decentralized system. So it's quite fascinating, actually. Well. If anybody's wondering, if, if you can't have this kind of a conversation with your financial advisor, you might want to look up Paul and his team, because uh, <laughs> this is the kind of conversations we're having all the time, like, what is happening, and how do we make sense of it, and how can we position for this? All right, so what is this unit? I actually hadn't heard of the unit till you told me about it today. Um, yeah, it's quite it, it's quite fascinating, So, and I hadn't heard of it till about a week ago. Now, I... Uh, my white paper is at home. So here's one of the interesting things. So, you know, <laughs> there are three sources. One of them's out of Sputnik, which is a Russian based um, uh, website that I can't access through my office because we've got all these lockdowns and, and restrictions. And at first it said, you can't go here because they're going to steal all your identity. So I have an old laptop that's, that I burnt the um, hard drive on. It has no data that I logged into and kind of read the article. But I read the white paper, so essentially, here's a good summary in the medium. Uh, let me pull this up so I can share with you. Oh, okay, I was just looking for a for a, a link to that. Yeah, yeah. So the so the medium. Uh, so this is the BRICS. Uh, the title is BRICS nations introduce new currency, which is a decentralized uh, monetary ecosystem. Quote the unit, and my camera's in the middle, anchored in gold. So anchored in gold. Anchored in gold. So basically, as we get through the article here, uh, without reading the whole thing, because this does a very good job of giving you the strengths and weaknesses, you know, uh, the birth of the unit, the idea of creating a unified currency for the BRICS nations has been brewing for years, going back to that article I read a minute ago. Rooted in the desire to reduce dependence on the U.S. dollar and enhance economic cooperation among member states, however... It was not until recently that concrete steps were taken to bring this vision to fruition. Now, Ooh, I, I, I like that, that sentence up there that led into that one, which is the unit aims to establish a stable and transparent alternative to traditional fiat currencies. Hmm. Yes. You know, I can't imagine, Paul, that's, that's just going to be allowed to happen without somebody getting cranky about that. Little pushback. <laughs> I wouldn't think so. <laughs> because so, the traditional fiat currencies have been the way in which governments have been able to abuse their citizens and overspend and conduct wars everywhere without having to really pay for it. Um, so, so there's a lot of political power in the West, I would say, uh, that's very attached to our fiat money because they're so easily abused and can be used for abusive purposes, which seems to, um, uh, for whatever reason, Many people seem to be attracted to that <laughs> in politics. I don't know why. Just my observation. So that's uh, that they're going to fight this. 
I would think so. I would think so. And the question is, you know, when, when, when I'm walking into uh, uh, a, an area covered in potential eggs, but, you know, why the escalation with what's taking place over in, in Russia and Ukraine? Why are we so willing to throw, to bring NATO into this? It's like we're begging for a war. I, I don't know all the geopolitics behind it. Quite frankly, I stay into the markets, but I always question why, right? Why, why do we have to do this now? Is it is it a move to protect um, to protect the fiat currency and the power that comes with it? Because quite frankly, that's an unbelievable amount of power that's wielded from our politicians on a global scale at this point. Especially since they don't even care about the rule of law anymore. They're just doing whatever they want to do and punishing whoever they want to punish. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, so th this is why this is such an important conversation to have, because what the BRICS have basically said, and so by BRICS, what we're really saying, to be honest about this, because this includes a lot of Africa, the BRICS used to be the B-R-I-C-S, five countries. Um, it's now up to 120 or something, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, but that makes a very cumbersome acronym. So when we're saying BRICS, we're really talking at last count, I, I saw just over 120 countries that have said not notionally, hey, we're interested, we'd like to sign up. When you add them all up, Paul, it's well over 75% of the world's population. So this isn't like a little fringy thing that's kind of happening with a couple of smallish countries. They have the, the lion's share of the world's pur purchasing power and economic output at this point in time. So this is one of these like uh, passing of the baton moments, which can be tricky. Let's hope the baton isn't fumbled in some comprehensive way. But I don't see my country, the U.S., really making any significant inroads to thinking about how they would strategically respond to that right um because if you think it through the united states people say oh we don't export much we export a lot <laughs> we mostly export debt and currency <laughs> but mm. man there's a lot of it out there so what happens if all that currency that's just floating out there and right now because we know with the panama papers paul that's parked in offshore accounts and the caymans the guernsey islands and it's just out there, and plus there's all the petrodollars, and there's all this stuff. If all of those suddenly decide to come home, as they say, what do you do with them? Like I've been, I've been thought gaming this out, not because I have this kind of wealth, but I've just been, I've been imagining what if I am one of these families who's mm -hmm. put a lot of trust in the dollar, and I got a hundred million bucks sitting. That's sort of a bogey number for me because I wouldn't know what to do with a billion, but a hundred million, and you suddenly said, I don't want these sitting in dollars. What do you do? Yeah. Do you? buy yen? Do you buy euros? Do you buy euro bonds? Do you buy gold? Do you buy an island? I mean, it's like, it's, 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 it turns out, Paul, my, my, is where I'm going. Once the big money decides that it doesn't want to be in dollars, it doesn't have that many doorways. There are not that many opportunities. There's not that many places. Little money, like I have, you can scurry around and do some cool things, but big money has got a whole different problem, doesn't it? It has, a, it has a completely different set of problems. And, and that's what can change things at the margin. That's what can tip the scales to where the powers that be can't necessarily control. You know, and, and one of the things that I get concerned about that I hope that our, our government doesn't do, if we get into a situation where our currency collapses, okay, See, what is it? I've heard that 60%, I've never verified this, but you know, from reputable sources, 60% of all dollars in circulation are outside the United States. Well, what good does it do for you to have those dollars if you're China and you're not going to do business with India or you know, South Africa or whoever because they don't want those dollars anymore? You're going to have to reinvest those somewhere else or you're going to have to spend them somewhere else. So, so you, if the only place that they're spendable is inside the United States, then you're going to buy everything that you can possibly buy inside the United States from housing to farmland to production facilities or, or invest and build into manufacturing facilities in the United States while those dollars still have relatively strong purchasing power. That's actually what I would do if I was a, southern, uh, a sovereign entity on the other side is buy and you know, turn this into our manufacturing base because it'll be cheap labor compared to us in the future. And that's not the world that we want to have as U.S. citizens. But as a U.S. citizen, right, it's like, okay, while I have purchasing power and I can buy it, you know, in, in quantities greater, you know, I can buy, convert to, to a higher value, you know, 
if you can, and I'm not making a recommendation, but if your resources are big enough, then it makes sense to buy land in uh, entities that are that are uh, kind to U.S. investors in ways that you get those assets outside of the U.S. Because if our currency is falling relative to everything else, it's kind of like German citizens, and you know during their hyperinflation, if they own foreign currencies or assets outside of the country it maintained its purchasing power relative to what it did at home. And can you imagine, yep. Chris, yeah. the housing, uh, how unaffordable housing is right now if our government leaders don't do something ahead of time and you know our children and our individuals and even our own are trying to compete against buying real estate, for example, uh, in relation to major uh, uh, foreign players that are having to shed their dollars. And I don't know that that's going to be the case because in a hyperinflationary event, even real estate is going to struggle to an extent. But, you know, that just sets up that environment where it's going to be ridiculously miserable for U.S. citizens. Yeah, it, it could get hard. Um, and, you know, it's really hard to take offshore money and convert it into local real estate. It's slow. Mm -hmm. It's cumbersome. Um, and you may not want to do that anyway because, you know, as we've been talking about, because, you know, we have the webinar coming up uh, in Ju on June 15th, which you're going to be at and a bunch of other experts. We're talking about this thing called the Great Taking, which is really just revealing these legal shenanigans, which have tilted the deck, you know, in favor of some players, and maybe against others. We've got to talk about it. And it's complicated, all this and that. But, you know, everything you're telling me, Paul, reminds me that, you know, capital goes where it's treated best. And... So for a long time, the United States has been there because we had rule of law. We had a, a fair-ish legal system that you could trust, right? And we had capital markets that were more or less free and fair. Maybe not totally, but pretty good, all things considered. And, and those three pillars have been just absolutely, I mean, I'm astonished at how quickly those are being knocked out. So here's a conversation I have with people all the time now. Hey, I don't think I want to stay in the United States anymore. Mm -hmm. And these are citizens, right? Mm -hmm. So why would a foreign person looking from the outside in say, yeah, I'm going there. I'm not going to El Salvador where they respect things and they have freedom and they're all about privacy and, you know, having having a, a low crime environment or Paraguay or you, you pick it, right? Mm -hmm. um, the United States is no longer that shining city on the hill where, where we've got that plucky can-do attitude with with unfettered capitalism you know as, as your paper filling exercise this morning you know started to i mean you can just feel it's just getting we've lost the plot line i think i think so too and i'm concerned about yeah. the ramifications from a long-term standpoint and you know the sad part is you know there's always that that you know, it's kind of like my grandfather said, you've got to imagine your integrity like a box that's around you. And that box has handles on it, okay? So as long as you don't take your hands and put them down on the, your, you know, as long as you don't pick up those handles on that box and you constrain your activities to that box that's around you, you have limits on what you will and what you won't do, okay? <clears throat> Obviously, but, but that is within your integrity. He said the moment that you, you reach down and you grab those handles and you stand up, now you're carrying that box around and you can walk all over the place and you can justify whatever you want and everybody knows that you no longer have integrity but you believe yourself that you have integrity because you're carrying the box around <clears throat> and that's my concern is where we have our politicians today you know they're justifying everything that they're doing but there are no boundaries that they're willing to cross to either stay in power or to, ref to keep from having to admit that they lied to us or the deception that's out there because they justified it because they're supposedly saving the world and they deluded themselves and the American citizen just like the rest of the world was frustrated after the 2008 crisis they suffered because of the foolishness within the United States and what occurred there not any individuals went to jail not on a public uh, uh, level there was no trials there was no changing it was hey you're too big to fail we're going to bail you out now we're going to incentivize you to be too big to fail and and we have really yeah. seen dramatic changes overall so um it, it's a frustrating time they're riding the coattails of a prior generation's uh integrity but they don't have it yeah anymore. you know um I, I, I'm a big fan. I, I've just been, I've been getting more and more conservative as I get older, or I've just been staying right where I am and everything else has just gone so far to the weird 
um, left that that it's uh, you know I, I appear right. I don't know. Um, but, uh, and maybe it's just a normal process. You know, you, you get, you get more conservative as you get older, but I, I've come around completely now, Paul. I used to, I was a good card carrying member of my society. And, and I do believe that, you know, it, we all have to share in things if we want nice things, right? If you want a bridge and a nice airport and infrastructure and things, you know what? Taxes have a role. I, but now I just know that my taxes are just absolutely frittered and used in ways I don't agree with at all. And I don't feel like I have a lot of agency in that, because even if we have an election, I didn't get to participate in the selection process of the people who ultimately you get to vote for. Right. You know, it's like 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 we're seeing that now. The primary there's been no primaries on the Democrat side. They, they haven't allowed any. There, there's no cho- it's like we'll tell you the choice and then your job is to choose it. Right. It's kind of a weird thing. But but this caught me. Um you know, in Massachusetts, so they're all proud of this, right? At more perfect union sounds sounds socialist, right? And they're all excited because the millionaires tax has already generated one point eight billion this year for Massachusetts, blowing past projection sounds good. And it's good to these people because they like this idea. We're hitting millionaires and we're taking their money away, which which I'm like, okay, but under what agreement did you take it and and, and did they have a choice in this? And did anybody really vote for it? Well, the good news is people do have a choice in things. So I asked Grok on Twitter. I said, "Hey, um, how's how's what's going on in the state of Massachusetts from a population standpoint?" And um, let me make this a little bigger. And they say, "Oh, yeah, uh, uh, asking about that. Yeah, well, uh, Massachusetts lost twenty two thousand six hundred thirty one people aged twenty five to forty four, and from April of twenty twenty to July of twenty twenty two, a staggering fifty seven thousand people more moved out than moved in." And I was like. What do we know about the income profiles of people? I said, well, the most common income bracket for those leaving the state was 150000 annually or more. <laughs> right? <laughs> so so it, it's, uh, uh, that's just, I mean, this whole thing, cause and effect, seems to just be missing from this whole thing. It's like, no, you don't just tax people and then get to a more perfect union. No. You tax people and they don't like it and they leave unless you have an open, transparent and fair process for that. And we're all bought into it and we agree we're doing good things with it. But in my state of Massachusetts, you know why they need more money? Because we have a lot of migrants who came in illegally and they need to put them up and they want to give them EBT cards and phones and rent and all of that stuff. And everybody I talk to at our little town fair, cute little thing, Chester on tracks, cute little thing. Everybody I talk to. Uh, was horrified by this. Now I didn't. I didn't find a single person. I talked to somebody with green hair. Not a single person was like, "Oh yeah, I support this. Good, uh, good plan." Yeah. So they don't. Even, they don't even about, care. No, they don't seem to even care, and that that is ridiculously concerning. And that that kind of leads me back here to to pick up that that unit again, because we. Actually, kind of just in conversation, laid laid the backdrop here. So let me pull this up. Well, this is important because when you lose trust, it's almost impossible. You never quite get it back. What you're telling me is that in 2008, they felt abused by the whole thing. Then, mm-hmm. then the, the United States did some other things which did not rebuild trust, including seizing Russia's sovereign reserves, proving they they weren't really reserves or sovereign. And 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 so this is all a reaction to this. But let's imagine, Paul, that that people now in the United States finally wake up and go, oh, this is bad. We shouldn't, yeah, let's repair this. I don't even know what we can do at this point. So I think this is, I think this is a done deal. It's on the way and we need to tell people about it because this is going to be a big change to everything. Yes, I, I believe, I believe this is, you know, if it rolls out in 2025, like some are speculating, this is, this is a game, this is, the morning after, I think, you know, this is the point where something changed and the next day is a completely different world that you live in. The question is how immediate are the consequences going to be, but everything mm-hmm. has changed. So, and I'm glad you pointed that out, you know, anchored in gold, it aims to establish a stable and transparent alternative to fiat currencies. But, you know, it goes through, talks about that brewing for years Drawing inspiration from the principles of decentralization and blockchain technology, the unit's designed to operate outside the control of central banks and governmental authorities. Instead, it leverages Mm -hmm. the power of a distributed ledger technology to ensure transparency, security, and trust in every transaction. So, according 
uh, anchoring the unit in gold serves, I'll highlight that, serves as a strategic move to instill confidence and stability in the new currency. Gold has long been revered as a store of value, immune to the fluctuations of fiat currencies and geopolitical uncertainties. So by linking the unit to gold, the BRICS nations signaled their commitment to creating a resilient financial ecosystem built on tangible assets. I'm going to add, not the whims of dictators who want to be. So features of the unit. You know, it's a decent. Now, now hold on one, one second. So, so this is really big. The, the, I, I got to stall there for a second. Okay. The whole idea of just the word decentralization, it's a big word. Maybe we skip past it and it sounds, sounds cool. That, that right there is like a, a wooden stake right into the heart of everything that is we've known as central banking, which has been highly centralized. You've got the Federal Reserve, you've got the BIS, you've got different central banks, and they are the locus of control. It's just eight people sitting around a, uh, a walnut table with a nice dessert trolley deciding what the price of money should be. Mm -hmm. That's centralized. That's also like communism, right? So we actually have a communist money system. And it's funny, the communists are saying, how about we do uh, <laughs> the opposite of that? <laughs> Let's have a free market money system that's decentralized. It's based on open transparency. And you know what's going to happen? It'll sort itself out. And some countries might have to pay more interest than other countries, not because somebody in a table set the interest rate, but because that's what the market sniffed out and said is an appropriate and fair rate of interest given the circumstances. It's, it's, this, is, this is a big deal. This is a total table flip. Like this is taking the table and just giving yeah. it the old heave ho. Game pieces everywhere. <laughs> and, and what amazes me is you're using the what everybody loves about blockchain as far as um, uh, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and Ethereum. You know, Bitcoin specifically, it's like, oh, it's decentralized. You know, blah blah blah. So everybody's person that it has all the benefits of this, of the blockchain decentralization. You have a backing by gold, and no one entity controls it. So you're not at the whims of you know, a, nepot a nepotistic system to where somebody gets put in a position of power because they're connected, not because they earned it. And that arrogance leads them to just burn the rest of the world down. So yeah, absolutely, you're right. And we're far better together in that decentralized network than we are with, you know, a few individuals that have a feedback loop within themselves and pat themselves on the back while they're burning Rome down. So um, let me share here. Y'all, Everybody listening, I'm still getting, I'm still learning how to efficiently share. I'm scared to death I'm going to hang up on us while I start sharing something. Yeah. Here. So I'll down just a minute. Okay, so features of the unit, decentralization, huge. Gold backing, which is huge. Um, you know, each unit's going to be backed by a specific, specific amount of gold providing intrinsic value and stability. This gold reserve is audited regularly to maintain transparency and trust. How you like that, Chris? Audited oh. regularly. Well, U.S., you can join our unit, but we're going to have to get inside Fort Knox and drill some samples and count some bars, <laughs> which the United States has been avoiding doing since 1974. <laughs> which, again, Paul, I'm the simple guy. If you won't let me look at something, I'm pretty sure there's a reason for that. That's um. exactly right. <laughs> that's why the Federal Reserve doesn't want to be audited either. Border exactly. Borderless transactions, you know, so with the unit, cross-border transactions are seamless and cost-effective, bypassing the complexities of the traditional banking system. And that's good. That, that's a big mm. deal because the banker, that's a big deal. the bankers, you know, control everything and take a clip of all money that we as U.S. citizens send overseas. So my uncle, when his uh, daughter was killed in a car wreck many years ago, took some funds from that. And, you know, and, and what people contributed and has built churches in Africa. And during the pandemic, it was nearly impossible to send money over there to help them make ends meet in the interim period because of all the gates you had to go through, all of the international and all of the funds. You know, one individual sent funds over there and 20 percent was gone. So borderless yeah. transactions in a decentralized unit that's cost and effective, that gets the bankers out of the way, too. And then, and then here's another part that I like about it. And this is, this is pretty fascinating because Ethereum, I look at more so, and 
and for those of you out there who really know this, you know, don't hold it against me, but, but uh, you know, I mean, I don't know this inside and out, but what's attractive about Ethereum is the smart contract capability that, that you know, I read a long time ago that they're wanting to work for it. But the unit ecosystem utilizes smart contracts to automate and enforce in great agreements, reducing the need for manual intervention and streamlining processes. So Chris, now all of a sudden you and I have an agreement, we sign that piece of paper, you've got a smart contract that's going to enforce it without somebody being able to weasel their way out of it. So it doesn't matter how connected you are to the local um, uh, political system, you know, you can't get somebody to bail you out if this is a decentralized um, smart contract system. So the benefits of the unit, as the article goes on to talk about, is stability. The gold-backed nature of the unit mitigates the volatility inherent in fiat currencies, offering a stable store of value for investors and consumers alike. Sovereignty. By creating their own decentralized currency, the BRICS nations assert their sovereignty and independence from the influence of global financial institutions. So, you know, guess what? And this, this is an answer to a country that has their assets seized, um, you know, in this sovereignty and decentralization. Economic empowerment, the unit facilitates greater financial inclusion and empowerment, particularly in developing economies with, uh, within the BRICS blocks and diversification. Investors can diversify their portfolios by allocating funds to the unit. Now, Chris, this was the thing when I talked to you about it. I didn't know if you could, but it looks like investors are going to be able to allocate parts of their portfolio to the unit, reducing exposure to the risks associated with traditional currencies and markets. And, uh, you know, and the article goes on to talk about challenges and outlook. And, you know, while it holds promise, its success hinges on overcoming several challenges, adopting and acceptance. Um, but with the collective resolve of the BRICS nations and advancements in blockchain technology, the unit has the potential to revolutionize the global monetary system. As the world watches with anticipation, one thing is certain. The unit represents a bold step towards a more equitable and decentralized financial future. All right, so I, I had to back up because I've heard the term a lot, and I suddenly realized I wouldn't be able to define it. So I asked, I asked Grok what a smart contract is, and it says here, a smart contract is like a digital vending machine, but instead of dispensing snacks, it executes the terms of a contract without the need for a middleman. It's a self-enforcing agreement that lives on a blockchain where the terms are written in code, automatically executed when certain conditions are met. So imagine a world where you don't need no lawyers or notaries to make sure everyone sticks to the deal. That's what a smart contract can do. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. So you might say, um, hey, I agree to buy three tons of copper from you. You agree to ship it. We have this smart contract. The funds are already there in the chain, ready to go. And then when that happens, when it's fully executed, like it just all, like you don't need. Yeah, that would be great. Bankers are going to hate this. Here's something I know about the whole banking, have studying history. They fight dirty when they feel like they're, privilege and power is being undermined <laughs> right so i could see a lot of people not being happy about this inside the halls of the western you know uh, hegemony of, of banking and finance well and think about how a smart ca contract could work for a uh, uh, the owner of a rental property okay so instead of the the political jurisdiction or whatever judge you've got i mean the reality is is if you have a contract with somebody to rent your property and they don't pay it Okay, then they should be evicted from that property. You know, they're they're basically squatting. So imagine if you have a smart contract that's laid out and says, okay, you know, you're automatically enforced. It, you know, if you're not paying that rent, you know, it, it, you don't have all this political pressure in there. What is is you signed it, you didn't fulfill your agreement, you're out. Or you purchase a car, right? and you don't make your payment, you know, the article that I read theorized a world in the future where you have, you know, uh, cars that can drive themselves smart cars, you know, and, and the argument was this guy leaves Georgia as an example, uh, uh, quits his job, quits paying his bills, goes to California, and the car speaks to him and says, hey, you have not paid whatever financial institution for your car for 90 days now, get everything out because as soon as you close the doors, I'm going to drive it back to the lending institution and you don't have to have somebody repossess the car. So smart yeah. contracts remove that conflict of interest and the political influence in a 
legal system that seems to be weaponized for political influence more so than the actual rule of law. You know what I would like to see? I would like to see a smart contract where a congressman running for the office has to encode how they're going to vote on a smart contract. And then if they don't, they lose their seat. Yeah. All done. Right? <laughs> no, I could see how that could bring greater trust to the system. That would be that would be great. You know? Well, how nice would it be if you had a smart contract that says, okay, you're going to be a congressman, you're going to be a senator, and you're going to sign this contract that says that, that you know, let's just say artificial intelligence as an example, is going to monitor all of your checking accounts, your donations and everything. And if you get a donation from somebody that you pass a bill for, you're immediately removed from office, you know, or, or it's immediately disclosed to the public. So, I mean, I'm going way down a rabbit hole, but there's fascinating yep. applications that could be taken place, but... You know that would be that that would be something that it, all the parties know what they're going into, and then you have a decentralized all, automatic implementation of that contract. I mean that's that's a game changer. I mean that that's a game changer on a global scale, and I don't see why even the U.S. would want to be involved in that, or at least try to move to get ahead of it and introduce something better. But that doesn't seem to be the case right now. It seems to be that they're sticking their head in the sand and going we are strong and powerful, we can do anything we want, and they, mm -hmm. they won't do this. It's kind of like the abusive boyfriend or husband that says, oh, she'll never leave me, and then there the, the day comes that she actually leaves because she's surrounded by people that, that finally helped her to see the light at the end of the tunnel and, and get out of that terrible situation. Horrible yep. analysis yep. came to mind. All right, so as we come into the wrap-up then, that's a lot to think about, but, but this is what I think I've been detecting in the price of gold, right, which if they... You know, whether or not this comes to fruition and, and you know, this uh, unit is going to be backed to some percentage by gold, whether or not that happens, it's, it's already clear that, that somebody's been accumulating gold. And this isn't at the retail level. This is at the big level. But I prefer to know where the big money's going. And the biggest of the big money, central banks, country level stuff, Paul, has been buying gold, also silver um, and possibly copper. Right. So we're coming into to an era I think I'm going to understand very well being a resource guy looking at it, um, you know, bird in the hand is going to be worth two in the bushes. I've been starting to say, particularly after I analyzed all the laws and shenanigans around the great taking, is 1010, the possession is now 10 tenths of the law, you know, like, and, and it comes down to a single word, control. Do you actually control what you think you control? Mm -hmm. And if you do, then you have some, some things you can exercise around that. But most people don't know that they have precious little actual control anymore. So here's a simple example. We saw seeing the videos of like the Australian guy making a hoot out of going down and trying to ask his bank for his money, right? Oh, those are hilarious. <laughs> They're hilarious, right? And he gives these really, some of them are not, you know, PG rated kind of like excuses, right? Over the, over the transom just to make fun out of it. But the point that's under that humor is that his money isn't his money. He has right. somebody on the other side saying, I'm going to have to ask you some questions and I have the right, if not the obligation and power, to deny you access to your money. Well, you don't, that's not your money then. Right. That's right. It's not. You have a gatekeeper right. that you have to please before you can get access for it, to it. Well, yep. you know, and I just happen to think about that gold price, Chris, because, I, you know, I love currency trading. Now, this has been something that I've not been able to do since about 2013, but, but I had currency trading in place when the dollar was declining, then all of a sudden things changed. And there are some strategies, right, that have to sit on the shelf for 10 or 12 or 15 years, and then you pull them out, dust them off, update them just a little bit, plug them in, and they work. So I keep up with these things, and I hadn't heard about the unit. But, you know, my question is, is they've been working towards this, we know, since the crisis in 2008. They've been open, they've been public about it. Did they finally figure out the pieces and they got together and said, oh, this is it. And then they got more aggressive on the, on, on the gold uh, purchases. I don't know. That's pure speculation. But something caused them to change. And when I look at this, this is the most reasonable introduction of any alternative on the global scale that I have seen that could please all parties involved. Well, with the exception of the U.S. and Europe but it could please the largest majority of the world's population, which you said, what, BRICS represents 70% at this point? That's more than the majority, right? 51% can turn the tide. Yep. Speaking of currencies, we're going to close out on this. I just want to alert people to this because I said I would. 
This is the Japanese yen. Don't let the green color fool you. Um, up means the, the Japanese yen is getting weaker compared to the dollar. It's currently at 156, call that 0.7 to the dollar. And just to put this in context, we can go all the way back to the year 2001, and you can see it hasn't been this week since, well, we got to go all the way back to 1998. Um, to get into this zone of weakness, but also it's the pace of change. And so you see it's been really weakening hard and they've had a couple of moments where they've tried to intervene in here. Let's go to, I think we have to go about to a one month, eh, three month might be able to show it better. So you see here, the yen was really weakening all the way out towards that 160 mark. This doesn't show it, but it touched it intraday actually in the overnight. And then this is a $50 billion reported $50 billion intervention by the Bank of Japan to buy yen and drive its price back up. Believe it or not, down is up. And this apparently was allegedly another $50, $50 billion intervention thereabouts. But if you put my cross here on where it currently is, Paul, eh, that was a pretty expensive $100 billion. Didn't buy them much. You know, basically shaved the, those little tops off up there. That's that's all that happened. So, so Japan's having trouble controlling the price of its money. So uh, that that's an issue. And then the second thing they're having trouble with is this which I'll pull in here and let me take this off. And so this is um, this is the 10 year bond in Japan. And so up means a higher rate of interest. It's breached what was a very important psychological level of one. That's just 1% on the 10 year, who cares? <laughs> but, that's um, a big but, but when you're coming off a of 0.35, uh, that's a full, you know, more than doubling of the rate of interest, right? Uh, but at any rate, it, it's, it's, they're having trouble controlling the price of their bonds and the price of their money. That's kind of a weird situation. So I just want to alert people that uh, I still think there's there's a creaking popping sound coming out of Japan. And um, it's connected to all of these other things we've just been talking about for now. So I think the Fed's got its hands full. I think it's going to have to. It, it said a while ago they were thinking about opening a swap line with Japan. I guarantee they did. Gave Japan dollars that they could then use to buy yen on the open market to drive the price up. Um, and the uh, exchange ratio down. So, well, in the next six months, we might we might uh, have the hindsight capability of looking back and understanding why the Federal Reserve started seeming so desperate to cut interest rates with inflation running high. Uh, you know, because one common theme on both sides of the aisle, even on Wall Street, was scratching their heads like, why are they so desperate to cut rates at this point? So, uh, we might know six months from now. Yeah, you know, okay. So we'll close on the last, last thing then, which is um, speaking about why are they so desperate to cut rates. Let's look at this really quick. Um, this is financial conditions index here. And so this is a summation of all the things, but basically as this number, as this white line is going higher, financial conditions are getting easier. And you can see the COVID stress way down here. Financial conditions went all the way down to a stunning, nearly negative seven on this scale. But zero is kind of like neutral. Anything above zero means can financial conditions are easy, and that means you get things like stocks going up in price, and you know you can get more house deals done, all that. But financial conditions, the Fed, why would you why, why would you need to cut rates, which is another way of easing, when we're all, we've been just nothing but easing since basically all of 2024, so yeah. far we're six months in, and it's been nothing but easier the whole way. Why would you need to make that even easier than that? Um, what, what, I don't, nobody's explained like what that would do for us besides maybe get more animal spirits into certain financial markets and get more speculation and maybe blow some more bubbles. But I mean, yeah, that's the only thing that makes sense for me. I, I haven't been able to find anybody that's been able to explain that either. It just doesn't make sense. If you're wanting to pull inflation out of the system, you should tighten financial conditions. You shouldn't make them as loose as they were at the peak of the pandemic when you know you just had money sloshing around communities in our nation like an overflowing you know like a, a hot tub in the back of a pickup truck driving down the road splashing money out everywhere yeah <laughs> it sounds like a southern reference but i like it uh, <laughs> hot tub in the back of a pickup truck in the back of a pickup truck before and we like well I, you know, it, it it stamped in my memory i'll still laugh about it years ahead <laughs> well you know but you're right here so so that's an important point, I guess, uh, that we should make here, which you did, which is that this level, this dotted line, it is as easy as they as they made it here in the context of post-COVID 
as easy as it was, it's that easy right now. That's where we are. So why would you cut more right now? Well, you would do that, Paul, if you're desperate, I guess, if you're scared of something, but you wouldn't cut. That cut won't be a sign of strength. Like, oh, things are good enough to survive a cut. So up to clown world, clown world. I People, I need you to get yourselves protected. Plant a garden. Make sure you've got some gold and silver, some other means of protecting your wealth. Take a good, hard look at where your portfolio is. Understand where you do or do not have control. We'll help yeah. you sort a lot of that out in our webinar coming up. Paul, you're going to be there. Um, and everybody, if you if you are not 100% sure that your financial advisor speaks this language, please set up a, a time with Paul. Go to peakfinancialinvesting.com. Simple form there. Fill it out. Uh, conforms with all the regulations. That it's a very regulated environment. So, yeah, <laughs> that that it is. And the one thing that I want to leave out there, Chris, is don't let this calm in the markets right now and all of this effort to keep the markets up into the election. And who knows? Maybe it's you know maybe maybe I'm being pessimistic and looking at that. But based on everything that we're seeing under the surface, don't let this make you be complacent. Okay, if you're if you're willing to ride through a 50% decline, if that's what occurs in the next 12 or 24 months, then good for you. Make sure you stay the course. Understand the strengths and weaknesses of your approach. Don't get into a position where you're making emotional decisions because that is the, you, you can't make repetitive decisions from a long-term standpoint if you're doing it emotionally. You've got to have a strategy in place, understand the strengths and weaknesses, what it can do, what it can't do. Make sure that applies to your situation, shores up the weaknesses and of, of you being successful, and then implement it. Perfection is not going to happen in the in the uh, period of time that we're walking into it, but you don't have to be per perfect. Michael Jordan wasn't perfect in his end-of-the-game shots, but he kept taking them, and he won more often than not because he had the courage to take them because he was focused. So you've got to have that in your investment strategy. If you've got somebody that's helping you do that, good for you. They're far and few between. You know, If not, give us a call, kick our tires. We may not be appropriate, but... Um, you know, hopefully we'll make a positive impact on your life for the time that we spend together. Well, very good. Well, Paul, thanks so much for your time today. We'll see you back next week. Everybody else, see you at either Peak Prosperity or give Paul a call. All right. Bye for now. Bye, Chris. Hello, Chris Martinson. I'm the CEO of Peak Prosperity and also Peak Financial Investing. And after watching that, you're probably wondering, well, what do I do with my money? Look, you both deserve and need somebody who can talk to you about what's really going on in this world, understand the situation as it is, not be steering you towards certain things that don't make sense for you or just keep you in a game that's already ended. Look, if you want to talk to somebody about the petrodollar declining or what is happening with gold or which sectors are actually the best ones to be in, given what the Federal Reserve is up to or the federal government, you deserve to talk to somebody who can answer those and has a few gray hairs and has been there through some of the economic cycles because, hey, we're in another economic cycle, so it's good to have that experience. Fortunately, at Peak Financial Investing, what we do is we go out and we scour and we look for the very best firms out there who satisfy one thing above all else. They've got great experience coupled to great customer service. So if you want to come by peakfinancialinvesting.com, there's a very simple form you can fill out. Just a few fields. You hit send. What happens is an email gets triggered out. It goes to uh, an endorsed firm of ours. You will get an email back. You can then set up a phone call for a 30 to 45 minute free, no obligation, no pressure call to find out if this firm is a good fit for you and to find out if you're a good fit for the firm. It has to go both ways. And if all that matches up, this will be one of the best things that could happen to you this year. So please come by peakfinancialinvesting.com. Very simple process. We would love to help you if we can. Thanks very much.